Hi everyone, welcome to the PD and Medications webinar with Dr. Camacholi. My name is Ashley Plouffe. I work in the Client Services with Parkinson Association of Alberta, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them in the chat below. At the bottom of your screen, there is a chat blurb icon. Click it and the chat will appear on the right-hand side. You can send your questions out to the whole group or just to the panelists with the drop-down arrow. Um, We'll be answering questions kind of as we go along, um, playing it by ear a little bit. Um, so just a little disclaimer, this webinar will be recorded. All the information in the videos by Parkinson Association and the featured speaker is furnished strictly for educational and entertainment purposes only. The service is not intended to be diagnostic, prescriptive, or replace relationship advice and or care of your physician. General questions about symptoms, treatments, available medications, complementary and alternative healthcare therapies and current research will be fielded. Dr. Camicholi completed his medical education at McGill University in Montreal. After completing a neurology residency at McGill, he obtained postgraduate research training in geriatric neurology and in movement disorders at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland, Oregon. He is currently a professor and the director of Cognitive Clinic and the co-director of the Movement Disorders Program. His major research interests relate to neuroimaging and brain changes associated with impaired cognition in patients with movement disorders. All right, well, thank you. Um, so, um, a little bit of a disclaimer, I do do research uh, and uh, so we're always uh, interested in that agenda. Um, but uh, uh, people living with Parkinson's disease and their uh, care providers have been hugely supportive and are really an integral part of research. And some of the uh, items I'll mention today, actually uh, some of the we've actually um, discovered through our research and we appreciate both your participation and support. Um, and these, and uh, on my slide, there's some of the groups that do support our, our current research um, at uh, the University of Alberta. And I know Dr. Ba did a talk on research, so um, if you want more on that, uh, she, she will have summarized the number of our research projects. So I'm going to kind of talk about the objectives today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about diagnosis and differential diagnosis. So differential diagnosis for medical terminology is kind of what else could it be is, is really the, the question there. And um, the reason that's important is, is some people have p features that uh, suggest Parkinson's but may not be responding as well to medication. So a possibility is that uh, you maybe you have something else and that's that's important to recognize both to understand why things are going the way they are and potentially for different treatments. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about treatment considerations. In fact, that's going to be the bulk, but it's a little, an hour is a little bit in the whole spectrum of what's available and talk a little bit on mo non-motor symptoms. So uh, movement problems are obviously the, how we diagnose the disorder, but non-motor symptoms, uh, including things like smell changes, uh, we'll talk in detail a little bit about what they are, are, are common in Parkinson's. Some people don't realize that, that was, that's part of the Parkinson's disease. Uh, un, unlike the movement problems, the non-motor symptoms don't have a lot of um, treatments that are proven and are, are a bit more challenging to treat. But important to recognize, again, if you know what you're dealing with, you're armed to be able to kind of at least understand it. And understanding is a little, is, is better than not understanding, I think. And then talk a, a little bit at the end, uh, more in the Q&A period, uh, about some myths regarding treatment. But as you have uh, questions and there may be ideas that you've heard or aren't sure of that, that may bring up some of the um, ideas that are not true, proven not to be true or not sure. You know, there's some areas that there's a lot of, a little bit of uncertainty. So again, if, if people are on the seminar who have Parkinson's, you recognize some of these symptoms. So tremor is a common symptom in people with Parkinson's. Slowest, slowness of movement, rigidity, or which we, which is really what we find when you do a hands-on examination. It's kind of a, it's a stiffness. People can notice stiffness, um, and so rigidity is when we feel stiffness on your, on examining a patient, and balance problems and, and mobility problems. So um, these are features of Parkinson's. They're also features of other disorders. 
Now, early on, uh, features that make me think this is really truly Parkinson's are actually often people start on one side, which is interesting. Nobody really understands why. It can be left or right, can, but one side generally gets involved first. Usually that difference from side to side stays the same over the course of the disease, but eventually things kind of merge together and you see uh, symmetrical disease. The tremor tends to be when you're fully relaxed, and that's actually a key for um, doctors examining somebody with Parkinson's. You have to get somebody fully relaxed to know that the tremor there. And sometimes people will say, yeah, I was sitting watching TV and I noticed this tremor in my hand. And that's, again, an, an idea, an example of where that would be really supportive that this is truly Parkinson's disease. The other key feature in Parkinson's is that the medication, dopamine, is, works. So when we get, well, I'll show a few slides uh, showing um, uh, what we see changes uh, changed in the brain in pe people with Parkinson's, and uh, there's a loss of dopamine producing cells. And when you give someone dopamine, the brain responds, and that's great. And that's one of the big, you know, uh, I'd say findings of the 20th century was the discovery that dopamine, there's loss of dopamine, and that people can respond really well to dopamine. And we have, and when you, when and sort of to to jump to the bottom line is. Uh, dopamine is actually the missing chemical for the most part and uh, manipulating how it gets delivered, how it gets uh, to the brain is a really important part of treatment. And then often over time, and we'll talk specifically about this a little bit more, excessive movements, twisting and turning movements, dyskinesias can develop. And these are again also treatable. Uh, they actually are a sign that the brain is responding to this dopamine, but they can be quite severe in some patients. Really usually a minority of patients, less than one in, about one in 25 or less will have bothersome dyskinesias uh, for which there are some treatments I'll mention. And again, all of this is really, if you have problems in any of these domains, it's important to talk to your doctor about it and we'll kind of give you kind of a little bit of a, a roadmap of, of uh, questions you can ask. And then atypical features. By atypical features, these are features that would make me worry that somebody at a first visit or in the first few years doesn't really have Parkinson's. So dementia is where people have uh, memory and thinking problems that are severe enough to affect your function, affect how you can manage uh, day to day. That happens in Parkinson's disease. Not everybody, but it does happen in Parkinson's. But if it's there early, we call it another thing. We would say, okay, this is not typical for early Parkinson's disease. Still important to recognize you still could have Parkinson's, but it's important to kind of sort of start you track the treatments a little bit differently. The blood pressure drops, uh, hypotension is what that means, um, is again a feature that you see in Parkinson's and actually can be a problem with the medications and requires adjustment. So again, something to keep in mind. Um, that um, is actually, if it's really there from the beginning, that raises the concern of other things. Um, again, these are all things the doctor should be thinking about, um, but doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean you don't have Parkinson's, but it kind of raises a red flag, call it. Uh, eye movement problems, double vision. Interestingly, double vision and vision problems actually do occur in people with Parkinson's, but if it's prominent early, there are mimics of Parkinson's disease. Uh, for, example, for example, disorder called progressive supranuclear palsy, which leads to more early double vision problems, early falls, and these would be, again, addressed differently. These, these other disorders don't respond as well to levodopa. The bottom, one of the things, though, is they respond sometimes a little bit. So it's not a bad thing to have tried it. And so sometimes, again, when we're waiting to see a patient or when we're on the phone with a community uh, doctor, think, why don't you try it? Because levodopa is fairly safe if, if somebody has uh, Parkinsonism, the tremor, bradykinesia, stiffness, but is um, has these other features. And then balance problems, again, uh, features, pyramidal signs are features that suggest strokes and things like that. And early gait and balance problems, again, would raise the concern. This is not really Parkinson's disease, although all, a, lot, a lot of these things, apart from uh, cerebellar and pyramidal, can develop later in the course of disease. So I uh, have to sort of kind of take a step back. So this, is, this talk was uh, for an undergraduate uh, course, and I kind of modified it a little bit for the audience. So again, 
please feel free to tell us, tell me if this is too much or too little information. Because uh, again, you're living with disorder and so know a lot about it, but I thought you should, you, you probably know more than most undergraduate uh, students. So I figured you, you, you could uh, 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 appreciate what uh, we were talking about. So diagnosis is important. And one of the things in terms of quality of care for people with Parkinson's is to think about every visit or every year, you know, or on a, on a regular basis, is this still looking like Parkinson's? Is there something else going on? Is it evolved into something different? Or even if, it, if it's evolved into something different, is this something new for a person? So that again, that reevaluation is something that I'm always thinking about every time I see somebody. So there are actually non-motor features. So these are the physical findings that you see in Parkinson's that I've sort of emphasized, but there are non-motor features that actually make us more confident that this is the diagnosis. So smell loss. So loss of sense of smell um, is, is a feature that actually is very common. Um, we, you know, we, um, I remember when we had a research project where we actually tested people's sense of smell and my research assistant came in and said, these smell tests are, are bad because nobody smells anything. And so I asked her to smell it. And indeed, it wasn't that it was bad. It was that people had a loss of sense of smell. So that's actually a feature that in an early patient where we're sort of thinking, okay, is it really Parkinson's? If that sense of smell loss is there, that really gives us confidence it is. So the other, some of the other disorders I was mentioning, I mentioned progressive supranuclear palsy where vision problems and balance problems are really a prominent early feature. They actually have normal sense of smell. So again, helps us and it's uh, to decide whether somebody has Parkinson's disease. Now other things can affect sense of smell. So head injuries, um, smoking can affect your sense of smell, those kinds of things. So you know it's not always uh, related to Parkinson's disease. Um, so the other feature, one of the other early features that doesn't happen in everybody, but is, uh, is fairly common, and if it's there, makes us really confident with smell loss, uh, is acting out your dreams. So um, some patient, people have, uh, really, they're actually moving in their sleep in a way that's act, act, acting as if they are acting out their dreams. We'll talk a little bit about treatment of that. There's actually not a lot of proven treatments, but there are some medications that can be helpful for that. And there are other things that can mimic this. So some people, you know, not, this is not in Parkinson's disease, things like seizures in the middle of the night or trouble with breathing from sleep apnea where you're, uh, you actually can't get air in uh, can mimic that because if you kind of are waking up, you can move a lot, but it's, these are really dream enactment behaviors. So there are things to look into to, if you have this kind of problem that are not just the REM sleep behavior disorder, but if you had smell loss, REM sleep behavior disorder, this actually would really actually nail the diagnosis. So that's actually very helpful for us in, in an early patient. REM sleep behavior disorder can happen in some of the other Parkinsonian disorders, but then we'd also expect other features that would kind of lean to us away from true Parkinson's disease. Now, another feature that is common is restless leg syndrome, like restless legs where you kind of have to get up and walk about. That can be something that we see with the uh, levodopa treatment too, where patients, as the medication's wearing off, you have to you get very restless. It's, you're not having enough dopamine. Uh, but if that's there before the diagnosis, that actually really, again, supports diagno uh, the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Things like fatigue, depression, anxiety, lack of interest in doing things and are fairly nonspecific. So these can occur for many reasons, actually strokes, small little da uh, area, um, damage to uh, decreased blood flow to parts of the brain, which are not a uh, feature of Parkinson's disease, but are not unusual and as we get older. So these are nonspecific features that are uh, things that can occur before the diagnosis, but the smell loss and the REM sleep behavior disorder are common. Constipation is also something that's common, but again, constipation is common if we're not very mobile, regardless of why, whether you have, an, you know, whether you're just uh, sitting around a lot. A lot of us are sitting around a lot at home. So, you know, that's actually an issue that does come up uh, even with non, people without a, a, a disorder. And uh, so it's not something to worry about specifically, but if you have things like tremor and uh, slowness of movement and constipation and notice smell loss, that's really a good signal for, again, somebody who's not yet diagnosed to see a doctor and try to get a, get a diagnosis. Any questions about the features? This is kind of a good, kind of good stopping point because these are the clinical features. And I know you had a Parkinson's 101. No questions yet? I'll keep going because we probably are very interested in getting into treatment. 
So one of the things that 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 uh, is the ba forms the basis for treatment are the changes that we see in the brain. So there are chemical changes. So dopamine I've mentioned a lot because levodopa gives dopamine. Dopamine mimics dopamine agonists give levodopa. But there are other chemical systems. So noradrenaline, serotonin, acetylcholine. These are other chemical systems that are affected in Parkinson's, and there are different treatment approaches to them. The trouble is that they're, they're not as well developed as the dopamine and the response to these other treatment approaches is not as clear. It's not as good a response. In addition to the changes in these chemicals, there's changes in the connections in the brain. The striatum is just the part of the brain that the part that has the loss of dopamine cells connects to. That system gets affected. So you have you know, a neuron and a connection to another neuron. And if you lose one, the connections get changed. And so that's actually one of the things to keep in mind. And on the right, I show a slide showing that there's actually changes throughout the brain as time goes on in people with Parkinson's disease. The trouble is, and so the red in, on the, uh, in panel B, the red shows what we think, we, nobody's proven this, but what we think is the progression. So early on, we see changes in the lower part of the brain where um, there's control of things like the bowel movement. So that may be one reason we have constipation early on. Uh, the change of sense of smell, the smell nerve cells are around are in the middle of the brain. You see my arrow moving, by the way? Yeah, so in the, in, so in the middle of the brain, there's a smell pathways. So these might get affected early. And then actually only kind of in the middle stage, this is sort of a staging system, do we see the motor stuff? And then as time goes on, there's more widespread changes in the brain that may be one of the reasons that the response doesn't continue as well. And one of the concerns with, a, let's say for example, stem cell therapies where we could put stem cells in the striatal system, but we're not treating the rest. And so that's one of the, the, the drawbacks of these kinds of approaches where it's really a whole brain problem over time. And so that's really what we, we need to think about preventing. So again, tremor, rigidity, slowness of movement, uh, and then the balance problems. We've talked about that. And I, just a reference to a very good review in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's pretty detailed. I read it just as a, to make sure that we weren't missing anything that would be a key new point for people, but it's uh, pretty detailed. So these are the features that make you think about the diagnosis. And then the tremor, again, tends to be at rest, but there are people who have tremor when you put your hands in front of you. And um, that is more commonly related to something we call essential tremor. It's not essential to have tremor, but essential tremor is a common familial kind of tremor that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get Parkinson's disease ever. But we sometimes see that actually in some patients who develop Parkinson's. So if your tremor is progressing, tremor is important to keep in mind too. It would be the other features, the rigidity, the stiffness, the slowness of movement that would make us think this is Parkinson's, not just somebody with essential tremor who's then evolved into, par into Parkinsonian tremor. Tremor doesn't, some patients don't have tremor. So just because you don't have tremor doesn't mean you don't have Parkinson's disease. But if you don't have tremor and you have slowness and rigidity, um, that makes us again, think of these other mimics of Parkinson's disease. Now the rigidity is again, something you feel on, on the physical examination, your doctor feels on the physical examination. It's hard to train doctors to measure rigidity. So I'm actually one, you know, one of the uh, challenges was we have some uh, neurology residents rotating through clinic now and we're trying to teach them how to examine people with Parkinson's so we can care for you better but it's really hard to you can't teach rigidity without actually feeling it so it's a bit of a change and uh, you know strokes can and spinal cord injuries for example get, give you spasticity which leads to a different kind of stiffness and if that spasticity is there, then we're thinking different things. This is not what we see in Parkinson's. Or if somebody has Parkinson's and develops spasticity, you know, have they had a stroke? You know, this would be the sort of thing we can, can think about. And then the slowness of movement. The slowness of movement can be of two flavors. One is inability to initiate movement. That's actually rare early on. Like you can't even start moving. That becomes common later in, in the course and um, may have some treatment op uh, options. And then the, just a the general slowness, which is actually usually a decrease in the amplitude. So big, you can do good big movements, but keeping going is hard to do. So this is where some of the therapies like think big uh, are helpful in terms of making you get overcome that tendency to kind of have slower and slower movements, either finger tapping or walking, step length, and those kinds of things. Those therapies are very important to keep in mind in, in a way to keep going and keep the movements at big amplitude. So here's a scary picture. So on the left, I, I, it's a picture of the brain. It's like a front view of the brain as if we could have put a slice like kind of this way. 
and uh, it shows the substantia nigra, which is the dopamine producing cells. And you see in, on this left lower one, it's all black. And on here, this paler, and that's actually reflecting the loss of dopamine cells. And on the right, there's just a colored picture of the same thing. So these, this area is just the same as this area here. And this shows that there's projection. So this is the striel pathway. This is where these neurons project to. And if you lose neurons, these areas kind of adjust and adapt. And so that's one of the things that has happening. There's multiple connections where downstream from the main area that the cells are lost, there's changes. And so the, actually the neurons in these projection areas become more sensitive, for example, to dopamine. And that's actually one of the reasons we think we get the dyskinesias. Um, and then this is on, on the lower left is you may have heard of Lewy bodies. These are stains for Lewy bodies that are the, what we find in the remaining nerve cells in the brain of somebody with Parkinson's disease. And that's sort of how, that's actually part of the diagnosis, diagnosis is the loss of cells and then the, and the Lewy bodies. And if you, if you, this is a correlation. So if you count the neurons, we did this as a project when I was a research fellow. If you count the neurons and we look at Parkinsonism, so higher scores are worse, the more neurons, the better you do. So again, there is a relationship to the number of neurons. But as I was saying that those downstream neurons are adapting. So people are like, you can actually lose a lot of neurons and the downstream neurons are changing to kind of be more sensitive to the dopamine that is still being produced. But over time, there's a loss of nerve cells and, and we lose that dopamine production and we become much more dependent on what we give by mouth or by infusion or, or the, the way we give the dopamine. So this is actually a dopamine PET scan. And on the right is a control. So these blobs are those areas where the neurons project to. And then in, in the somebody with Parkinson's, we see a smaller blob and we see actually a difference from side to side. This is brighter and this is less bright. This is somebody with tremor, with a central tremor. I mentioned that diagnosis. And this is somebody with the other Parkinson's mimic PSP, which shows kind of a rounder symmetrical blob, uh, uh, oops, sorry, rounder symmetrical blob. So dopamine imaging is available um, in, in Canada now. It's actually been just available for a few years and, and can show a pattern that looks like Parkinson's disease. It's most useful if you really are wondering, could this person have essential tremor? Because actually there is a shrinkage of the blobs in PSP. So it really doesn't, isn't the right test to make that diagnosis. But if somebody, if we're not sure somebody has, could have essential tremor or some medications can worsen Parkinson's. This is an important treatment point. For example, metoclopramide is a medication that's done, get, sometimes given for nausea. It's a good drug for nausea, except it worsens Parkinson's. So some people are actually come in and are on metoclopramide for their nausea or stomach upset. And they, they look like they have Parkinson's disease. They'd have a normal looking uh, dopamine imaging scan. But the bottom line is recognizing that, that this drug causes it is what you need to do. It's, you don't need to do a scan. You need to stop the drug. And maybe actually some patients, their symptoms can completely resolve. So drug-induced Parkinsonism is another thing to consider. But the other thing we, we've seen a few times in clinic is sometimes you... For, whatever, for a good reason, you might be put on a drug that can worsen your Parkinsonism. So always keep in mind as you're taking a new medication for whatever reason, can this worsen my Parkinson's? And so that can sometimes happen. I've had a, patients come to clinic where they're worse. And you know, this, some of them have been patients who've been doing really well. And again, they're, they're in the spectrum, people do really well. And I've not understood. And I said, have you been started on anything new? They said, well, I was started on this metoclopramide, as it turned out in one case, and that, that actually their Parkinson's worsened, and then it returned back to, nor to you know, good range when they were taken off that medication. So this is, this is a, a complicated picture. The substantia nigra is where the dopamine neurons are lost. These are the projections, and the, this projects ultimately to the brain, the, the gray matter of the brain. So the point here is just not to remember all of this. Don't, uh, I barely can remember all of this, but to know that there's multiple connections. Some of the connections are connections which are kind of dampening behavior, sort of slowing things down. And some of them are excitatory where the neurons are actually stimulating other neurons. So it's actually a very, even though we think of this substantia nigra as being where the cells are lost, there's actually a bunch of steps before we get output, which is our movement. And the damage of substantia nigra, basically, if you look at that slide, the lightning bolt of movement diminishes and that's what changes. But you know, the other thing is there's an opportunity to kind of interfere in different places. Can we block this excitation? Can we block this inhibition to, to diminish uh, 
the uh, to increase the excitation. So there's actually all these steps. That's one of the problems with sort of let's say throwing some neurons. Let's say for example, uh, there's a way of taking a virus and putting neurons that metabol that affect the metabolism of dopamine into the putamen. You throw them there, but there's lots of other steps going wrong, and so that is actually makes it very challenging to treat the medication during doing a non overall approach. So this is what happens with levodopa when you take it. So I'm, again, we talked about dopamine, why it's important and why it's our main therapy. We're treating that missing stuff. We're not necessarily fixing the whole circuitry, but we're actually uh, at least replacing what's missing. So levodopa is what you take in, let's say, Cinemet or uh, Prolopa. It's actually in the blood metabolized into different breakdown products. So th there's a couple of enzymes which are um, catalysts of the breakdown, which we can actually block. So methyltransferase is one, amino acid decarboxylase is another. We can block those. So there's more dopamine floating around, which allows more levodopa to go into the, bra into the brain. And then um, to work, to actually do anything, it has to go into a neuron. And so this is the red dots getting bright. That's the dopamine going to the neuron. And be, it's metabolized into dopamine, which is the missing chemical. So, uh, and then once it's released, it gets released. And then its action is stopped by um, basically being taken, re taken up into the neurons or just floats away in, uh, into the space around the neurons, or it's metabolized by the surrounding cells of the neurons uh, by various enzyme pathways. And all of these are sort of potential approaches to treatment. So we can actually block its metabolism we can actually block its metabolism in, in the brain. This methyltransferase is actually also found in the brain, in the glial cells. We can block its metabolism by the MAO and enzyme. So there actually are drugs that are available that do all of these things. So we can make the levodopa last longer. And that's what those approaches are doing. Um, it's not a good way to drop, block reuptake. And there's, you can't really block it floating away. As neurons drop off, actually, um, uh, there's other neurons that surround the, the main neurons that produce dopamine and they sort of sort of take over, but they're not as efficient at dealing with the levodopa. So this is question one was, it's always a question of when do you start? So this is a results from a study that started people early, like sort of at the time of diagnosis versus delaying the start of levodopa therapy. So there's no real advantage to delaying it if you're if that slowness, that tremor, that uh, rigidity is, in, is bothering you and interfering with your function, it's reasonable to start at this point. Now, if it's not at all, it's, you don't have to start. I mean, this is, this is the thing. But what they found was in this, in this study, in the blue is the delayed start group. And UPDRS total is just the park, you know, just how we rate the slowness, the, the stiffness, and, and your symptoms. It actually stays you know, in a certain range, it's not that good, but doesn't change that much, but it does worsen over time. In the early start group, there's an immediate improvement. And uh, that sustained, this is over, over, uh, over um, about a year. And then when this delayed start group started, they, they didn't lose any ground. So there's not anything wrong with delaying, but there's not anything wrong with starting. So that's sort of the message of this. This is quality of life. Actually, the, for a year, the, the late start group had a little had worse quality of life. So quality of life reflects, you know, are you doing things? Are you having some compromise in what you can do? That's a year, and so that's actually a year. Even though the, you, the there was a catch up after treatment started, it's not you know if you're sort of this, the Parkinson's symptoms that you're having are interfering with function, why lose a year? And so that's sort of my, my approach. There's no evidence that that starting early causes problems, but over time, people do develop problems after you're started. And this is sort of another uh, bit that is relevant for treatment. So some motor complications include fluctuations where the medication doesn't last or dyskinesia, as we mentioned those early, those excessive movements. They're actually more common in younger patients. So this, is, this graph is, this is actually from a study in the 70s. So that, and the data are still as good today as they were back then. Is about 90 to, uh, 80 to 90% of young, younger patients will develop fluctuations or dyskinesias. And uh, in older patients, it's much, about half as many will develop that. So that by old versus young, in this study, they were sort of over 65 versus under 60 kind of thing was their, was their split. So actually does, that has an influence on what choices of medications you might make. You can treat these complications. Um, so, you know, if, if people are developing wearing off or on off, you can 
change frequency of giving your dopaminergic medication. You can add, let's see, I showed you blo dop uh, the metabolism blockers, um, uh, the C catechol o methyltransferase uh, blocker like and tacopone. You can actually give those to make the me medication last longer. Those are good ways to treat it. This dyskinesias, there's actually also ways of treating it. And Freezing of gait where people can't initiate. I mentioned that's not an early feature typically in Parkinson's disease, but again, there's potential treatments. We'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. A bit. And then the neuropsychiatric problems like depression, psychosis or hallucinations where people see unreal things, usually develop later in the course. Same with dementia, usually later in the course, but kind of important to keep in mind. It's the motor complications that are happening with, within five years. And then blood pressure drop. I mentioned that's not a typical early feature, but it can develop, especially with the dopaminergic treatments. So again, the general principle, that red, this red line represents the amount of levodopa in your blood, which sort of reflects what's in your brain. If you develop these fluctuations, yellow is reflecting how you're doing. So if you kind of, you, this is improved, versus worsening. So if you improve, but you're sort of having these off periods during your, your treatment time, one, the simple approach is to increase the amount, give something that makes it last longer, and that usually leads to more improved time. But the price sometimes as you get more advanced of, of the improvement of the Parkinsonism is the development of those dyskinesias. So again, it's always a question of fine tuning. I don't know if any of my patients, I sort of say you've become, you've gone from a, a reliable car to a Ferrari. So Ferraris can work really well, but they need a lot of tuning and fine tuning to, to work really well. So if you have wearing off, you can, you can actually treat with a dopamine agonist. Now, dopamine agonists are mimics of levodopa. They last longer. Their, their blood levels, I just showed you the blood, how long levodopa lasts in your blood, but they last like maybe a few hours more. So you can, if you're on a dopamine agonist and you've started dopamine agonist, but I'm going to talk about the cautions about dopamine agonists. A lot of people aren't anymore. Um, you can increase the amount. You can, uh, there are longer acting preparations uh, as well, but um, the side effects are the issue. So dopamine agonists actually are good drugs. And again, we talk to, uh, you know, that's, it's an option for patients, especially younger patients. Remember the older patients are less likely to develop the fluctuations, but in younger patients, it's an option. But the problem is the side effects. So the side effects of agonists, they're more likely to cause nausea. They're more likely to cause drops in blood pressure when you start them. And they're, one of the side effects that can happen in about up to 50% of patients over time is something called impulse control disorder, where people can develop compulsive gambling, compulsive shopping, compulsive computer use, um, sexual kind of uh, impulsivity. Those are serious side effects, uh, you know, especially shopping or, uh, or, or online buying, those kinds of things. So those are side effects I would warn somebody about as that can happen in up to 50% of patients over time. And if some studies are 20%, some studies are 50%. You, you still can get them with levodopa, but they're much, much less common. So that, and another side effect of dopamine agonists is, is excessive sleepiness. So again, when you're titrating those doses up to get better response potentially, you actually, um, can develop those side effects. So those are side effects of those drugs. So if you you know if you're on them and you're doing well, that's good. And then you don't have to worry so much. But when you up the dose, that those side effects could occur. Or when you're choosing what would you start with, that that's an issue. So levodopa itself is the other option for starting somebody. There's actually we'll talk a little bit about something that can be done before you really need treatment. Um, and again, this can be done. It's done with a decarboxylase inhibitor. It if you're wearing off, you can increase the dose, increase the dosing frequency, add the drugs like entacapone to make things last longer. Stilevo is a preparation that just combines it, just a little bit more convenient pill form. And um, so this is a, the other approach to treatment. Initiating treatment, often we're discussing this choice. Sometimes people who are on levodopa, who ha don't have risk factors or concerns for, for the side effects, we can add an agonist to the levodopa to make things last longer. But again, this is a question of fine tuning. I have to say in the last decade, since we really appreciated the impulse control disorder, and I have to say, you know, in my experience, we've kind of sometimes missed it because people aren't really anxious to tell you about these things. Um, we've, most people have chosen to choose, uh, start with levodopa, and then we work on the therapy, on the, you know, uh, fine tuning it. And 
you, on levodopa, you are more likely to develop dyskinesia fluctuations, but I'm saying here, we've got options of trying to how to modify those if those do develop. Um, Rosagiline and selegiline actually prolong, remember that was that MAO inhibitor pathway, increase the duration of action of levodopa in the brain. So there's a number of ways to increase the duration of action of levodopa in the brain or dopamine in the brain to kind of make the wearing off better. But that's sometimes the price is again, more, a little bit more dyskinesias. So dyskinesias are an issue. Um, again, preventative therapy, the dopamine agonist patients are treated patients are less likely to develop dyskinesias, but then they have all the costs I was just telling you. Not against dopamine agonists, but you have to kind of weigh that when you're ta talking about choosing to what you start with or what you modify. And once they develop, you can, if they're there when the medications are effective, you might have to lower that dose. So you decrease the levodopa or agonist. Continuous delivery, that's available in the Duodopa pump, that uh, the program that Dr. Sukoworski uh, runs, but that's a pump that's in your gut, which is again, uh, fraught with side effects of having a foreign body in you all the time. So there's a good side to it. And if people have bothersome dyskinesias or fluctuations, that is an option. Amantadine is a drug that is actually, a, it's an anti-flu drug. That was, and that's how they discovered that it worked in Parkinson's. It actually improved patients with Parkinson's who were living in nursing homes who were given it as an anti-flu medication. But it also has been discovered to improve uh, dyskinesia. So bad dyskinesias that we can't control by manipulating the dopaminergic medications can be improved with amantadine. And the other approach is surgery. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So here's a study looking at dyskinesia risk and what they showed that there was basically 25% of patients or 15% of patients who are on, on a dopamine agonist develop dyskinesias within five years, whereas around 50% of patients who are treated with levodopa. That fits with that old study from the 70s, so very consistent. But again, all those potential side effects of dopamine agonists. I still use dopamine agonists in some patients after we've discussed risks, benefits, and alternatives. Usually, again, early patients and older patients is really not a good option. So over 70, I'd, I'd say why not? Why avoid it? There's really no gain and you're not getting the biggest bang for your buck on terms of the uh, benefit. Um, again, we talked about the side effect of the agonist, nausea, hypotension, the impulse control, the sleepiness, and then actually they're more likely to cause hallucinations. So let's say somebody is on an agonist and is starting to develop things like hallucinations or blood pressure drop. What we're often then doing is getting them off the agonist. And, um, and seeing about how things do. Swe leg swelling is not usually a reason to stop, but some people do, it's really bothersome. And so we will stop agonists for leg swelling as well. A little bit on di diet. I wanted to kind of make a comment at this point on diet because malnutrition is not uncommon uh, in people with Parkinson's. This is from uh, the ESPN guy, uh, the European uh, Dietitian Society guidelines. You know, and so, uh, you know, if you're losing weight um, or kind of having to modify your diet, uh, or having swallowing difficulties, it's important to kind of think about your diet. And, and some people have, are very informed themselves, but a dietitian, so see a dietitian and ask about advice. I don't know if Parkinson's Society, Parkinson's Alberta, I mean, um, has dietary support. I mean, that's something that would be, it, dietitians are available in the community, so it's worth considering it. Um, it you know, swallowing difficulties is one of the problems. These are usually when people are developing balance problems. That's what honing your R3 means. And then, but they can be disease related. Nausea and constipation can affect your diet for sure. And um, so, um, so some things like uh, uh, pegolite or, uh, or uh, uh, so the uh, PEG-1000, which is a kind of a, a kind of osmotic um, con anti-constipation agent. Plenty of fluids, plenty of walking. So those are the other things that can help with diet. Lots of fiber in your diet. So those are important to keep in mind. That'll help get rid of the constipation and nausea, uh, although sometimes it can be quite difficult. Um, also, if you have a lot of dyskinesias, there's a lot of twisting and turning, and that can lead to, you need a lot of energy for that. So it's really important to try to figure out how to eat to kind of maintain that energy. And of course, some people, again, they said, as I said, not everybody, but some people are sort of forget their cognitive impairment kind of can interfere with your everyday life. And, um, and that's actually something that can affect diet. So then more scheduling needs to be you know, meals have to be bring, brought in, potentially socialization. And sometimes, again, at advanced stages, being in a, in a group sit, setting, I mean, now everything's a little bit on hold, but in a group setting, 
where you're living and where meals are provided can actually be a good solution to this malnutrition, which can affect the longevity. There's very inconclusive evidence for vitamins, but again, I wanted to mention a couple. So vitamin D deficiency is very common in Alberta. I wonder why. We have so much sun, but we got to wear lots of clothes to, to, in the winter. So that kind of prevents us from getting the natural vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D deficiency is an issue. And so it's important to take supplements of vitamin D. There's a very few conclusive uh, data on vitamins. B vitamins are also kind of deficient in people with Parkinson's. So levodopa, good, good drug we just talked about, actually does interfere with the metabolism of B vitamins. And so B12 and folic acid is important to, uh, to make sure you have enough. We don't know what the right dose is. So generally what I recommend is a multivitamin that contains B. Some people like taking a little bit of extra folate or, fol or B12. Not a big downside to that. Uh, folic acid is supplemented in cereals in Canada. And so that there's not a big need to have supplement that extra. And again, one of this is a research study we did. We actually looked at B12 levels in patients. And we found that if they, we, we didn't, it wasn't a study to look at level, uh, uh, vitamin levels, but we looked at the in, impact of the vitamins. And if people were taking a multivitamin, it wasn't causing downstream effects or deficiencies of, of, of levodopa. Interesting, and tacopone may also protect against this deficiency. But it's again, that's not necessarily for everybody. The other thing to mention in terms of diet is really the MIND diet, which is actually um, co a common sense diet. Lots of fruit and fibers, which you need to do anyway for the constipation. So four or five servings of fruit and fibers every day, fish periodically. I know some people don't like fish, but a couple of times a week, one or two times a week gives you the right omega fatty acids. And actually any study, for example, they've looked at this in, in heart disease and stroke prevention. Studies that have looked at taking a pill versus natural dietary approaches to things like omega fatty acids, the dietary approaches really win. So that really the pills don't give, aren't the answer, it's dietary approaches. So this is just a summary of what we've already talked about. So the dopamine is metabolized, and tacopone can block that metabolism. We can, this is the levodopa comes already as combinations in prolopa or levodopa. It's metabolized in nerve cells. It's released. Amantadine works all over the place. We don't really know where it works. The dopamine agonists work directly. There are drugs called anticholinergic drugs. So artane and um, benztropine are two anticholinergic drugs. They were actually a, really around since the, the, the 19th century, these kinds of approaches. They're actually found in alkaloids in belladonna plants. And they do improve symptoms, but the problem with those drugs, and again, some people are on those drugs, they do work really well for things like tremor, and they will work well for things like dystonia, so twisting movements that sometimes are part of the dyskinesias. But the problem is, if long-term, if you take these drugs, eventually they affect cognition, so they affect your thinking. They also cause uh, the constipation and they also cause bladder retention. So we tend, to, I don't think I've actually started anyone on an anticholinergic drug in again, probably uh, over a decade or two decades. There's the occasional patients where, you know, they have really bad tremor and they work for that tremor. And I actually had a patient who did have uh, benefit from an anticholinergic drug for his tremor. And every time we tried to get him off of it, his tremor got so bad, we left him on it but his cognitive impairment became quite an issue. And actually there's some evidence that, that the, the anticholinergic drugs can actually worsen brain changes that are associated with cognitive change. So it may actually accelerate that cognitive decline. So again, if you're on Artane, if you're doing well, I think you're doing well, which is good, but I think this is one of our ways of preventing cognitive decline. And then we mentioned these drugs that block the metabolism. So these are our, really our choices available right now. So I'm going to, any tr uh, questions about treatment, I'm going to talk a little bit about deep brain stimulation next. I do have one question here. Good. Thank um, you. It's more of a general kind of question. Um, it is that you see many drugs being approved for use um, by the FDA in the States. Ah. What is the timeline for the same medication being approved for use in Canada? Yeah, that's a good, and so I don't know the answer to that question because I don't work in that office. I do, I had a uh, high school and university colleague who did work in Health Canada, but he became a travel agent actually. So he went, and so, I mean, he actually is a very smart guy, but it's, it's a slow process. I mean, I think we, they use all the evidence. I think again, actually interestingly, recently in the COVID era, uh, the uh, actually Alberta government mentioned, you know, taking into account evidence from Europe and evidence from, 
the states and all kinds of evidence in terms of approving new drugs. That's not for Parkinson's disease. So health kind of approval, it, it, it ranges. We, we had, so one of the, the Rosagiline, is approved by Health Canada, for instance, but is not covered by Blue Cross. So there's a lot of bureaucratic uh, barriers to, to getting drugs approved in various, uh, various places. Now, Health Canada is careful. They do a good job. But again, I agree, there's some delays, for example, for some of the drugs that, but again, a lot of the new, again, this is a good question because a lot of the new developments in drugs are actually new ways of delivering levodopa, for example. There's a new dual action drug. There's a new um, uh, aerosolized levodopa to get you on quickly if you're off quickly. So those are a couple of new approaches. They're not available now. They might be approved. The, the other barrier is getting insurance approval. So, you know, whether they're approved or not. So I don't have the answer to the timeline. It, it, it varies, basically. Um, but once you have the, the drug approved, if it's similar to an older drug, they might not approve it for, like Blue Cross might not approve it. So that is actually an area for advocacy. They do, there is a process for, so again, to do a dopa pump, there's a process for approval for new therapies. Um, and so that was actually relatively quick once it became approved that, that the Alberta cover decided to cover the, uh, the duodopa pump therapy. But, you know, again, maybe we could have avoided that if we could have given you some rosagiline and, you know, other approaches. So, yeah, so I don't have the absolute answer, but again, it's an area for advocacy. I'm going to move on to surgery just so we have time. You have one other question, actually, okay. um, if that's okay. If it's related um, to, yeah, the other stuff, yeah. So, well, okay. Two other questions, I guess. Okay. Um, so one is the about protein and cinnamon and that interaction. Yes. That's a great yeah. question. I, I um, so leave it. So, uh, so protein in your diet does interfere with the levodopa going uh, going into your brain. There's, it blocks the amino acids in protein. So generally, so but you need. I just talked about malnutrition. So you need protein. So the question is timing. So generally, it's suggested that you take your levodopa if you can, because it, sometimes it's too nauseating, about a half an hour before your meal. This is a, the regular levodopa preparation. Long acting can be taken more with the meal because it's more slowly absorbed. So, um, so that's sort of the one aspect of timing. And the other thing is not to have big protein meals. So uh, smaller amounts of protein in the meal. This is where it actually finding a dietitian, a certified dietitian to talk to them. And again, I would suggest this is a topic for Parkinson's Alberta to have as a, you know, kind of a, a seminar. Uh, you know, that's another approach. If you're doing fine, you know, motor-wise, your respondent medication is lasting, you're not, there's nothing to change. You don't, you're doing okay. That's, that's the whole thing. But over time, you become more sensitive to that protein and that can, can become an issue. So I think talk to a dietitian, you know, it, uh, the regular levodopa or prolopa half an hour before a meal, long acting, not so much of a time issue. Um, and then kind of spread your meals out. So like if, if you notice that, for example, breakfasts are tend to be more carbohydrate rich. Or if you are noticing that you have, you know, uh, trouble with the medication kicking in after you have bacon and eggs, but on the day you have cereal, it's not so bad. Maybe that just you need to require uh, adjust your timing of your medication, or that you know your meals a little bit. So you have to think about it. But if you're doing fine, you don't have to think about it. But you know, it could ha could become an issue down the road. It's not causing you any harm, but again, you might need adjustment. Great, thank you. Um, the last one here is the difference between regular Cinemet and Cinemet CR. Um, how long does the effect last? Yeah. And how long does it take to start? Perfect, yeah, so that's a good question. So Cinemet CR and, and a regular Cinemet have been compared in studies, and there is a difference in uh, the, how long they last, about a half an hour to an hour more for CR. CR is more slowly absorbed, and uh, so there's a, often a difference in kicking time. Everyone's so different, it's hard to give you a number, but it can be different. So most of the time when people were not sure of the response, how, you know, somebody's sort of like saying, I'm not sure I'm getting any benefit. Sometimes we'll, if they're on CR, we might switch them to regular because we're a little bit more reliable absorption. But we've had, I've had, a, again, this is not the majority, but some people we've tried that switch and they were really better off on the CR. So if you're doing well, and again, the answer is if you're doing well, you don't worry about it. Sometimes we, you know, again, it doesn't kick in quick enough. So sometimes we'll use a combination of CR and regular. So a little bit of, like I take a CR plus a half a regular or a full regular. CR, should, you shouldn't split because then you lose that uh, benefit of the, um, of the um, slow absorption, which lasts longer. And I'm finding more and more because entacapone is available. 
it, I'm also often just using regular Cinemet from the start. But again, if you're on CR and you're doing fine, don't worry about it. If you're not kicking in quickly enough, adding a, reg, a, part, a part of a regular to that might work. Sometimes just switching over to regular or Stilevo, which has the, you know, the short, you know, the rapid absorption of the regular plus the uh, and tack up on to make things last longer. And this is again, an area that a, uh, there's a number of preparation, a couple of preparations of new kinds of formulations of levodopa that are uh, potentially available. They're going to cost more money and I'm not sure they're going to be hugely better than kind of just working with what we have, but they'll, you know, they'll probably be good options for individual patients. But this is one area that, that may be slow to get approval and slower to get, you know, kind of, coverage for. I do want to get onto surgery, not so, not so much that everybody's a candidate, but just to talk a little bit about, you know, where it fits. So there, there are surgery, surgical approaches to Parkinson's disease, and this is really not for everybody. Um, so there's tremor can be treated with uh, lesions. This is actually a little stroke in the thalamus or stimulator put in the thalamus, which is one of that. remember, it's one of those uh, parts of the circuit. Ultrasound, focused ultrasound, which is done in Calgary, but we our, our surgeon, Dr. Sankar, evaluates patients for focused ultrasound as part of that program. And gamma knife therapy, which is irradiation of the brain, which causes a delayed damage to the brain, That, but if we interrupt that circuit, that can improve tremor. The problem with all these tremor approaches is that um, you're creating damage in an area that's very sensitive. So often, really, we are restricted to doing a one-sided approach. Tremor is something that responds very variably to levodopa or dopamine, any dopaminergic approach. So tremor actually can respond really well in some people and not so well in other people. So it's a real challenge in some people. So, but these tremor surgeries are options. Uh, fluctuations and dyskinesias do the best. And these are people who can get the palatal surgery. Uh, again, was part of that multi-circuit uh, picture that I showed, and I'll just show you as a reminder, and as, uh, the, the, a nucleus called a subthalamic nucleus. And then gait impairment doesn't improve and actually may worsen with surgery. So that's actually one of the contraindications. So if you're already having walking difficulties, especially when the medications are effective, we're concerned that the surgery is going to make you worse. Older patients also can get worse from surgery. So that uh, people over 70, we're sort of very reluctant, the surgeon is very reluctant to operate because on average, people get worse. So we don't want to make you worse. Now, even though you might have some of the features that could respond, we don't want to make patients worse. And there's a thought to early surgery. By th this is a study that looked at early surgery. By early, they mean around seven or eight years in. So, you know, after the complications have developed. If you don't have the complications, it's not clear that you want to do surgery because there's a big risk to that. So this is, again, the same picture I showed before. So in these multiple connections, and this is an excited, excitatory connection. So if you move this excitation away, you're going to be less blockages and more excitation and more better movement. So that's really what surgery does. And so there's one that this inhibitory pathway can be surgerized and the excitatory pathway, and that leads to overall improved movement. So that's the mechanism of surgery. And it actually was sort of found by kind of accident that people had discovered this and then kind of led to what's available now. The key though for surgery is you have to respond to levodopa. I'm gonna skip this slide. This is just a patient. This is a graph showing, um, basically it's complicated, but the words are more what's important. What it showed that if, if your response to levodopa was really good, then you were really, you had a really good response to surgery. If you don't respond really well to levodopa, so if you're not responding to the medication, you're not going to respond to surgery. We, you know, we still should treat you. You know, definitely need to be treated and you know everything maneuvered to kind of make things the best possible. But this lack of response, so the the, the you have to have a 30% improvement in, in symptoms with dopamine to actually benefit from surgery. Otherwise, you don't benefit, and and the harms are there. You are sticking an electrode in the brain or creating a hole in the brain, and that you don't want to risk that if you're not a responder. Doesn't mean you don't have Parkinson's, doesn't mean you aren't you know, getting some benefit, but that's a real key to this choosing who would go on with surgery. The tremor is a bit more difficult because again, um, if you, the, the, where, just where the lesions have to be for the tremor or the, uh, the stimulators have to be for the tremor, they're actually in areas that can control swallowing, 
balance and so that we, we are, usually we're doing unilateral surgery for those patients. This is the early STEM study. So this is, again, by early, I'm talking about seven or eight years in, so not like early, 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 um, where they found that if you were stimulated, people did generally better in terms of quality of life uh, than, than uh, medical therapy. But these are people who met those criteria, who clearly responded to medications, didn't have cognitive impairment, didn't have um, and had the real good reasons for surgery, that is the fluctuations that couldn't be. So you have to have a, an, a good attempt to trying to work on timing of medications and all of that. So those, that, they still met all those indications. And, but then there was an improvement in the patients who went to surgery. So again, we're, we're trying to identify people who would benefit. Sometimes people, again, people I know, and for good reason, don't like to have an electrode in their brain. And I, I would be concerned about that and will choose medical therapy because of that, that fear and, and maybe appropriate fear. Because if something goes wrong, it, you know, it really does go wrong. Not goes well most of the time, but it's again it on, an option only for a, a subset of patients. And again, I said, as I said, the gait impairment and postural impairment again, it doesn't respond to therapy, it's not as responsive to medications either. either. So, this is where physiotherapy, occupational therapy, exercise to prevent any further decline are really the keys to uh, maintaining gait and balance impairment. And if it's there early, it's other diagnosis, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't think of exercise or physiotherapy. Um, so exercise was something I wanted to mention. Uh, it, it actually uh, may be a good thing. And in, in fact, I'll show some examples from one of the only studies that has shown a potential protective effect of anything in Parkinson's disease. So, but it's, there are very, various kinds of exercise. Aerobic exercise, like treadmill training, cycling, walking briskly can be exercised. Strength training, Stretching is another form of exercise. Things like yoga give you, gives you strength training and stretching. Um, and then more complex things like dance, tango, uh, tai chi are actually other forms of exercise. The problem is, you know, the, the Nike motto, I might get sued by Nike now, but the Nike motto, just do it, but do what? And that's, the, that's where we're at with exercise. We really don't know what the best approach is. Um, this is uh, uh, this is the study by Shankman for a couple of years ago that took early people with just newly diagnosed uh, Parkinson's and showed that if you could exercise, this is the, the two, either the 60 to not 80 percent of your maximum heart rate on a regular basis, they actually had suggested half an hour, three three to four times a week. Um, there was less change in the Parkinsonism, so the overall rating of the Parkinsonism was less changed over over the course of the of the treatment trial which is about a half a year six months um on friday we was just on a conference call where uh for newly diagnosed patients we're, we're hoping to do this the the, the follow-up to this study so we're part of a multi-center group that are we're invited to participate in the follow-up to the study so we're trying to set up this project of course nothing's starting yet so i'm hoping in a year we'll be uh, be able to offer that for newly diagnosed patients who aren't, don't need to be on treatment. Because if you need to be on treatment, you need to be on treatment. As that was the message early on. So that's aerobic exercise. Um, this is another study that suggested some improvement in, in aerobic exercise from the uh, Netherlands. Um, this is a home-based program. Again, um, that's sort of an, another approach. But they didn't really show a benefit of two different types of approaches but they showed some improvement in sort of quality of life type measures. This is a study again by the group that ran the initial study, but it's strength training. And so they looked at strength training and they found that actually some cognitive aspects could improve with strength training. So again, not uh, actually, interestingly, they're, they're two groups. They had two groups actually both improved. And so again, exercise is probably not a bad thing in, in this group. And this was sort of aiming at cognitive improvements. And so there's some of the cognitive aspects. And this is again, a study from a, a colleague, Ron Postuma in Montreal that did tango training. And we, we did a study where we actually did feedback while people were walking to make people walk faster. So there's a num number of approaches. I'd say the key is try to stay active. And again, we talked about how that could have a benefit from from uh, to, to constipation, to diet, to absorption of medication. So try to stay active. Generally, the, the, the recommendations are 150 minutes of a mild to moderate exercise a week. That's a lot of time. But, you know, if you think about it, 30 minutes, three or four times a week, or, you know, and it, still can, it still adds up and it's still good for your general health. Couple, we're almost at the end, actually. So are we okay to go a few minutes more?
Okay. I wanted to talk about an area where there's not a lot to talk about, except it's important to recognize, is the non-motor symptoms. This is a, the star here refer, refers to some of the, again, I focused a bit more on medication approaches, a medic, where medications have been proven to be beneficial in some of the neuropsychiatric, the blood pressure types of changes, the sleep and wakefulness changes, and the miscellaneous symptoms. So, you know, there are medications and there's, there's uh, psychotherapy that can be useful for depression and apathy. There's actually a new study that one of the medications that's useful for cognitive impairment can improve apathy. Uh, but a lot of the other treatments, or sort of anxiety, there's no studies about what to do with anxiety. But I still would suggest that if somebody has a lot of anxiety with Parkinson's, you're still you know, getting a referral to a psychiatrist if your doctor or family doctor are having trouble getting a handle on it. The impulse control disorder, I think what we're trying to do is really prevent it. Like not, you know, if somebody develops it, get them off that dopamine agonist. So, that, so modify the medications for that. But there's no specific treatments uh, for that. Psychosis, where people have hallucinations or false ideas. Again, there's a number of approaches, but none of them are, there, and a few of them are proven. So that, again, the key is to not accept that, but to talk to your doctor about it. Uh, drooling, uh, usually suggesting referring to a speech therapist. There, botulinum toxin injections with dry out the salivary glands can work. We do them, but I've been disappointed in how sustained that response is. So I'm, I mean, I don't do it that often because it just doesn't seem to be a good response. Like sucking on candies, um, like, and you do want to avoid sugary candies can, and chewing on gums can sometimes help that swallowing mechanism. And if you're having choking or, or trouble with swallowing, definitely a speech therapist assessment. The blood pressure drops are important to recognize. Sometimes it's actually just stopping medications, like the dopamine agonist is causing blood pressure drop, maybe cutting back a little bit will help. But there are some medications that can help with that. Um, uh, by genital urinary bladder or bowel incontinence and, and uh, erectile dysfunction in men, uh, there are some medications, sildenafil, which is useful in, in the general population. Again, we really suggest talk to your family doctor. It can cause a drop in blood pressure. And then the gut stuff we talked about, things like um, the uh, diet, uh, dietary things that can be useful for that. And then sleep and wakefulness is not a lot of treatments, but it's a big problem for some people. We do use, for example, for REM sleep behavior disorder, melatonin or clonazepam. So those are options for that symptom that people might have. And then daytime sleepiness is a tough one. There's no real proven treatments for that. And sometimes the dopamine medications can worsen that. So if you're a dopamine agonist, kind of getting off of that would be an issue. Um, fatigue, there was a, a, a small study that suggested some improvements with fatigue with some medications. But um, one of the th key things with fatigue is it's sometimes related to drops in blood pressure. So we kind of usually suggest thinking about that. Um, why we have all these symptoms that aren't dopamine related is because the changes are widespread. And this is just a picture just to kind of remind us of that. Last bit that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is cognitive impairment. Um, cognitive impairment is important. It, again, it, it's not uncommon. It's not everybody. Um, there are risk factors. So again, for Parkinson's, there are genetics, there's environmental factors, there's age. And then uh, some of the motor features, so more symmetry. Remember, Parkinson starts more asymmetrically, one side different than the other. Mobility difficulties, falls. These would suggest that somebody's developing cognitive impairment. That blood pressure drop, the REM sleep behavior disorder and hallucinations, these are often precursors to cognitive decline. And this is a, a slide that, uh, that, that's a very, one of my, my favorites in, in the sense that this is, the top is pre levodopa the bottom is after levodopa so at baseline this is um, people treated with levodopa in australia they because they didn't they weren't very nice to the drug companies they didn't get uh, dopamine agonists very early so they actually just had to use levodopa they were stuck with levodopa so they just you know studied it very carefully and this and there's a response early on this is what we were saying these are patients with parkinsons and then the response top to bottom the difference from the top to the bottom stays now then there's one group in black still has a response, but less of a, but don't get as good as the, as the other group. So the group that keeps responding to levodopa was the group that were cognitively intact. So the cognitive impairment actually is correlated somehow with the levodopa response. So people who lose response to levodopa, we can we still, still adjust it. So this would be a patient, you do respond, but you don't respond that well. Your percentage response in this one's 50%. And this one is like probably 20, uh, 10 to 15%. 
So this is not going to be somebody who's going to do well with surgery. They still respond, but they don't respond as well. So cognitive impairment is important to recognize. And if somebody's having a loss of motor response, you know, you definitely should be adjusting medication, maybe increasing the dose. But let's say that leads to hallucinations. We are worried about the cognitive impairment. And there are some approaches to treating cognitive impairment. And remember, I talked about different neurotransmitter systems. So rivastigmine is a drug that increases acetylcholine, which is uh, kind of one of the other neurotransmitter systems that's affected in Parkinson's and has been shown to improve cognitive function. Generally, the improvements are not dramatic, but improving a little bit of attention, improving, you know, kind of a little bit of ability to function better is something that's worthwhile. So it's something that we do treat, uh, think about. And if cognitive impairment is an issue, you know, probably before cognitive impairment becomes an issue, think about things like advanced care planning, personal directive, those kinds of things should probably be in place before you are having cognitive concerns so you can be a full participant in making those decisions for yourself and your family. And so, yes, the cognitive impairment, there's medications, but then there also becomes more of a need for thing, uh, things like support services that, that are, are really what, what's important to get that, that environment uh, uh, supportive for the person with cognitive impairment. Often we're suggesting either uh, home care uh, referrals, um, you know, can, a case manager to help with, uh, with managing some of the issues. And uh, so that's actually something that, that's important to keep in mind just because, uh, you know, we hope that you're in this group, that's this group that doesn't have any change that keeps responding to levodopa. But the reality is, you know, patients will develop the cognitive decline. So the idea is to kind of, okay, let's work with, it. let's figure out what we can do. The studies that showed you a benefit to, for exercise, there aren't any real good studies that show a benefit of preventing cognitive decline, but that's sort of one of my dream projects is that we can sort of say, okay, somebody's developing cognitive decline, can we prevent this from progressing by exercise? There's actually a study in non-Parkinson's mild cognitive impairment where people develop cognitive problems but don't have dementia in trying to see if we can get people to exercise to prevent dementia. I think Parkinson's is right for this. And, you know, in my, in my spare time, maybe if COVID keeps going, I'll write a grant to do that. And I'm sure we'll have some uh, volunteers. So with that, I'll stop. I've got, uh, so the summary is Parkinson's affects motor and non-motor circuits, multiple chemical systems. And then the motor signs and symptoms respond to medications. There's some manipulation that needs. This is where you need to work with your doctor, your pharmacist, um, you know, your dietitian. I'd sort of add that to the team in terms of this. Um, some of them, non-motor symptoms can precede the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, but they can change over time. And then to some extent, dopaminergic medications help, but you really need to think beyond dopamine. And we really need to think beyond the doctor and the pharmacist, and I'm adding the dietitian, but the, the, the physiotherapist, the exercise therapist, I mean, like I'll say in broad terms, exercise therapists are important parts of the team to kind of keep things as, as good as possible. And of course, you know, the social support part of the team is actually really important as well. So with that, I'll actually stop for questions. I've got a, a few myths, but I think we've answered them. So Parkinson's is not only motor, it's not important to delay. You can start when you need relief of symptoms. There is a way to delay the need for levodopa. Uh, uh, is one of the drugs, or um, rosagiline is a drug that seems to delay the need for levodopa, but it actually has its own symptomatic effect. Mucanopurins is more natural, but it's also unregulated. We had a question before about regulation. The formulations ver vary, and so we don't know what our get we're getting. Uh, DBS is not for everyone. And then transplants, I don't think will cure Parkinson's, but in the, that group that responds really well, maybe that's the group, but we still have, don't know how to pick that group. And there are lots of research projects going into that, those approaches. High dose vitamins, not necessary, but some vitamins probably useful and it's important to exercise. I think we've answered a, a number of the myths. These are the myths I could think of, but uh, if you have others you want me to talk about, uh, I'm open to questions. Great, thank you. Um, so I do have one other question here about Cinemat CR. Um, yeah. They are curious if the same dose is as effective in two small pills versus one pill twice the size. That's a great point. Um, um, it's probably similar. 
it's probably there's probably a little bit of a difference uh, in, in absorption. Again, everyone's so different. I mean, we we I talked about the levodopa getting from the blood to the brain, but it's also got to get in your gut, get through your liver, get into your you know into your in, you know. So there's actually a lot of steps to that. And that uh, absorption from the gut, two pills like one pill, depending on where it's sitting in your gut, might be getting absorbed a little quicker. Another might be getting absorbed a little bit less quick. So there may be differences. On the other hand. The big pill is like huge. And so um, I, I've actually done the thing where somebody's taking CR. Um, I, I, often we use it at bedtime because again, we want that lower, so, slower absorption. So you kind of have some benefit that maybe trickles into the morning and they just can't take a big pill. So I've suggested they take a little pill. So again, they're probably not exactly the same, but they're probably pretty similar. And so if you can't swallow the big one, two is fine. And the other thing with the two is it's easy to go to three. Whereas if you're kind of a one big pill, two big pills is a bigger jump. So again, sometimes in, in terms of like, you know, over time, people may need a, a dose adjustment. You can go to three more easily. That's a good question. But one of the things, again, I, I, I'll, bring, I'll bring up this other issue that comes up is that there's a brand name and generic in various preparations. Now, generic are, you know, made by different manufacturers. So the absorption is different because there's different filler ingredients in, in the levodopa. And um, if it's working for you, it's fine. But if you switch from one brand to another brand, whether it's brand name to brand name or generic to a different generic, there could be slight differences in absorption. And again, it's, this would be especially for somebody who has a lot of fluctuations. We might not be seeing... Um, you know, you, you might actually have more off time because they've, they've uh, switched preparations. Sometimes, again, the pharmacist has done it for you to save money. But if you don't know, you sometimes go, oh, no, I'm not doing as well. It might be that the change in preparation. So keep an eye on that. If you're doing well with what you're on, you don't have to work. I don't care if it's generic or non-generic. I think the, ge the generics work fine if it works. The non-generics work fine if it works. But sometimes people do... Um, uh, that that switch can be a little bit of different in terms of the uh, bioavailability. And there's been some issues um, regarding availability of sort of non-generic formulations. And so people are switching generic. And again, I'd say most of the time it's fine. And, and, but some of the time it's not fine. And then what, what do we, what do we do? So the key is, again, I think one of the points of the talk is that a lot of it is just getting enough into your blood to get into your brain. So sometimes you can even, you know, in a, let's say you switch from generic to a non-generic to generic formulation of X, whatever, levodopa or uh, uh, levodopa, uh, dopamine, uh, cinnamon CR. You know, if you're not responding as well, we can just up the dose. If that's all that's available, that's okay. You just, you might need the dose. But again, again, where that fine tuning becomes an issue, especially if people have a lot of fluctuations. Okay, thanks. Um, I have another question here um, about the success rate of DBS. Is there a number? Yeah, so um, it's not 100%, you know, and um, a small percentage, probably about 5% will have complications. There's, you know, a range of complications, including stro include strokes, um, which, which often bleeds because you cut a blood vessel bleeds around it, infections. Inflammation, the brain can respond in an inflammatory fa fashion. So it's, you know, probably, that's probably less than 10% that will have those severe complications. That's, that's concerning. The success isn't too bad. I'd say in patients who meet all those criteria. So this is why, where our, you know, if you are not responding to levodopa, don't even bother because you, you know you're not going to respond to DBS. If you don't have the indications of dyskinesias and fluctuations, that aren't responding to medications, again, you're not gonna to respond to DBS. Like for example, if it's walking problems, that's not gonna respond. So if one of the reasons that the success isn't too bad, so let's say more than 50% success rate of, of, of the DBS is that the patients are highly selected. We, we, don't wanna, we don't try to put people through it who are not gonna meet criteria to respond to it. So if you don't respond, uh, like if you, after you take your levodopa in, in the morning, what we do, what, what uh, we do, like if you don't meet criteria, it's not worth even going through the process of being selected. But if you do meet criteria, then we make sure that you don't have cognitive impairment, swallowing difficulties gets worse with DBS, um, gait difficulties get difficult. So if you have a lot of those problems, that's not going to be a good uh, choice for you. So it's pretty good, but it's, very, it's in a very selected group. 
Okay. And once the, you know, once that you know the widespread changes are occurring in the brain, I think that's a signal that the DBS isn't going to help. Because that actually, even though I kind of emphasize like some of the newer therapies, like the virus therapies and the stem cell therapies, are very targeted and they're not going to work for a widespread disease. DBS is the same. It's it's the same circuit that has to connect. That's why why I tried to show that anatomy. It's like multiple steps along the way, and DBS kind of helps that one little step, which is good but it doesn't necessarily kind of cure the whole thing. And that's, I think where, again, I, I, I'm surprised, not surprised, but there's, there's things in the pipeline that are trying to aim to prevent that progression of disease. There's nothing available yet. So that's, that's the bad part of the news. But the good news is people are trying to sort of say, okay, well, can we reduce the uh, production of the, the proteins that go into the Lewy bodies? Nothing proven that can work yet, but there's sort of some, uh, safety data that's just come out that those therapies are at least safe. So then the next step is, okay, do they work? And that's going to be where things move in the future. There are actually smaller molecules that are trying to affect the breakdown of uh, uh, the cells once they get, uh, let's say, uh, insulted by the, these, these uh, Lewy body changes, the synuclein that goes into the Lewy bodies. So there's actually a number of approaches. And I think that to me, it may be a combination of sort of focus therapy and then uh, another kind of drug that can prevent the progression. So I, I think there's a lot of hope down the world. The, 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 that the, the up interpretation of this slide is there's a group that does really well. If we can figure out what's different between these two groups, and that's actually one of the focus on our research. We have a um, the, one of the sponsors is the uh, Canadian Institute for Health Research, the CCNA study. We're, we have it's, We have a biomarker study, which is taking people who volunteered into that study, getting lots of blood from them, getting imaging from them. And we're trying to decide, we don't want to, we want everyone to do well, but we know that in reality, people, some people will not do well. If we can figure out what the difference is between the group that does well and the group that doesn't well, sometimes we might identify a way to kind of manipulate something in your blood uh, that can then improve the outcome of patients. So that's the where, again, this is not research where we're doing a drug trial, but we're trying to and identify targets for future drug trials. And there's, you know, again, I think you need all the angles to try to be uh, to, uh, targeting the disease. I'm particularly interested in exercise. So, because that's easy to do and you can do it now. Just not sure what to do specifically. For sure. Do you have time for one more question? I do, yeah. I, I, I booked an hour and a half. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, can you speak to the uh, connection between rigidity and pain? Why does rigidity lead to pain? Yeah, very good question. Um, so rigidity, you know, again, you're not moving a joint or you're not moving that. So if you look at a video, so there's a, a great uh, article I read once is a, a doctor, remember the days when you're, you actually had to move your wrists to uh, wind your watch up? You probably don't remember this, Ashley, because before your time, like way back when I was a kid. Anyway, people, they actually had a, a doctor who was a, who became a patient as well, uh, sort of noticed his watch kept dying. And it was because he wasn't moving that arm. So if you are, so the, the slowness of movement is again highly correlated with the rigidity. So you're not moving the limb as much. So then that leads to kind of secondary developments such as shoulder pain, arm pain. Also, there's, there is a stiffness in the joints. So it's, it's, that's why I think the rigidity can lead to pain. Not everybody with rigidity has pain. I've actually got some uh, people in my clinic who are really rigid. And it's like, can't believe you don't have pain. But, you know, it's sort of like there's, you know, sort of, again, there's a lot more than just the lack of movement and the stiffness in the muscles and joints that is secondary to the lack of movement that's there. So in terms of treating the pain, that's a, I'm glad you brought that up. There's not a lot of proven therapies to pain, but one approach is to treat pain as a pain problem. So, um, you know, I'll often tell people, you know, go to your family doctor, we'll, you know, the, the, you know, normal pain approaches, uh, non steroidals sometimes, again, you don't want to be on those long-term physiotherapy, uh, massage therapy, those things can be helpful. At the same time, from the neurology per, neurologist perspective, we can try to work on optimizing the treatment of the rigidity. So that's, an, you know, so that's basically dopamine. Okay? So we can work on that. But at the same time, you, the point is you might need to work on other things like, you know, where you might need to see a physiotherapist for range of motion exercises in addition, or think about massage therapy in addition to uh, manipulating. And some patients will need pain medications. And some people we do 
uh, we or I, or the family doctor refers to a pain clinic because uh, again we'll we'll work on optimizing that dopamine response which will help and sometimes it's that's enough that that'll that'll that's really what was the issue but it's really that there's other things in the muscles and joints that can lead to that uh, that pain issue and so then you kind of going to a pain specialist going to a therapist actually might be a better uh, you know not a better approach it's, i always say it's it's complementary we really need to think about both uh, sides of that. It's one of the places that um, I've had some patients try um, CBD oil and, and cannabinoids. And there's not, I didn't mention those specifically, there's not a lot of evidence that it benefits anything in Parkinson's disease, but pain is actually something that is benefited from those approaches. And again, I would sort of defer to a, a specialist in that area to say, okay, is this, a pain, is this pain worth, not worth, it's always worth treating, but is it gonna be potentially benefiting from that? There's a downside to the cannabinoids. They affect memory and thinking. We just talked a lot about memory and thinking. They also can in increase psychosis, although there are trials you know, thinking about using them to treat psychosis. But again, we don't know what those results are. And uh, they can increase sleepiness, which again, as I sort of said, is another problem that we run into. So, I mean, there's, there's every, an up and a downside to everything. But yeah, so I think it's a good question. I think the rigidity, but the key thing is, the additional point is I think it could be just muscle and joint pain. And oh, uh, one of those, again, the studies we, we did years ago, again, I'm sure some of the people on the call or certainly on, in, in the community I've, I've participated in, we compared pain in patients with Parkinson. We had a control group of older, and this was basically, I was focusing on older patients because they were at, where they were at most risk for cognitive decline. So I was trying to understand why some people will develop cognitive decline versus some don't. We, comp we did a study looking at quality of life, and we found that the determinants of quality of life were, um, uh, were uh, actually mood, depression, and cognitive impairment. Those, those affected the quality of life of our group that were in the study more. But actually, we found pain no different between our patients and our controls. And so I thought, well, that can't be. And, and it wasn't that nobody had pain, but a lot of things that happen with age, sort of stiffness. So this is where even though the, the, the stretching and, and that kind of therapy may not benefit motor function, but they may benefit other things like stiffness and, and which can lead, you know, would be associated with pain. So again, I think definitely uh, a, a non-physician approach is also useful, but also, you know, engage your family doctor, think about, um, again, again, and this is an area where it's potential, you know, massage therapists, physiotherapists, uh, even chiropractic, we don't like neck manipulation because of the potential of stroke risk with neck manipulation, but back, you know, back pain. So those are specialists that can help you with the aspects of pain management beyond the neurologist that, that can, we have sort of a bit of a narrow view. I, I, I kind of use this analogy in clinic. I'm kind of like a place kicker, you know, in football, you kind of, you're good for those three points. You're not good for the touchdown, but three points are useful sometimes. They can add up, but we're not, we're not, uh, we're part of the team and really it's a team that's, uh, that's uh, moving things forward. Great, thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Shikamacholi, for being able to join us for this webinar on PD and medications and sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate your time. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Our next scheduled webinar is on May 6th and for information, on PAA, please visit our website, parkinsonassociation.ca, or follow us on social media. All webinars will be shared on our YouTube channel and our website. And have a great rest of your day. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thanks for the questions. Great questions today. Thanks.